morning, Crossroads. We are here kicking off week three of Family Reunion, and I'm excited about where God's taking us today. I got to be honest, sometimes when I prepare for these sermons, I have the realization that I needed to hear this before everybody else did, and today is one of those days. So God's been beating me up about this topic, so just brace yourselves, because I feel like he's going to speak to all of us today. Are you with me on that? I mean, we can all lean in and and let God speak to us today. I hope that that's where we're at today. Uh, I want to welcome everyone who's watching today, Uh, our Mishawaka campus, St. Pete campus, everybody out in drive-in, everybody who's in home, at home in their pajamas watching online. However you're watching today, I'm so glad that you're here. And the reality is, this is really important for us because in this series called Family Reunion, what we are talking about is the importance of family and inviting Jesus into the center of every one of our relationships. We started in week one talking about parenting, how we stack the deck for success so that we can pass down this legacy of faith from generation to generation. Because at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that any one of us can do. Use our influence to connect the next generation with Jesus, whatever that looks like in the situation you're in. Last week, we had Lamoris and Megan Crawford with us. Who was excited about that? Who thinks they did a great job? I thought they did a great job. The idea behind that was you've got to invite Jesus into the center of your marriage. Uh, Marriage is not easy. They said the definition is W-O-R-K, and that's exactly right. Marriage takes work. But if you find yourself drifting off away from, from each other, know this, that if you refocus on Jesus, if you center your marriage on Jesus, if you love the way that he loves, if you forgive the way that he forgives, with that love, that agape love that is selfless, that is sacrificial, that serves, that is going to keep you right where God wants you to be. That is the strongest marriage you can possibly have. It's Jesus at the center of your marriage. Well, today we're just expanding that circle, the ripple effect, to just general relationships. And I think in life, our families are the most important relationships that we have. We have our good friends. Those are important relationships that we have. And then it's the work colleagues. It's the people that are your neighbors, your friends' relationships. Every single one of those relationships, I want you to realize this today, God has placed those people in your life for a reason. If there's someone in your life who you know that you're you're in contact with, that you have influence with, who is desperate for the hope of Jesus, you have the opportunity to live on mission and do everything you can to let your light shine and connect them with Jesus. But at the end of the day, our relationships, they matter. They matter to God and they matter to us. And we have close relationships. Many times it's family. And honestly, when you think about how relationships form, uh, a lot of that comes from even when you were born and the order that you were born in in your home and in terms of your siblings. Did you guys know I was a psychology major uh, in college? I'll ask you the question, how do you feel about that? And the truth is I don't care because I'm not a good psychologist. Um, but the, the idea is birth order actually is significant in shaping like how you view relationships and how you are wired. If you're a firstborn, I mean, just raise your hand, firstborn. Let's go with this. I'm, I'm the oldest in my family. Let's give a shout out for all the oldest siblings. Come on now. Um, listen, the oldest sibling led the way. They blazed the trail for all the other ones. So be appreciative, all right? Be thankful. Uh, We had to do all the hard work, all right? We're usually the drivers. We're a little bit more organized. We're getting things done because that's our role. We're the leaders. Isn't that right? Firstborn. Let me hear you. Come on now. Don't leave me hanging. That's That's what I'm talking about. You see how strong that was? That's so good. Then you got the babies of the family, the youngest. Who's the youngest sibling here? The the, the last one? Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, raise raise your hand real loud or real high. Let's let's hear you. You know, or don't because you're the youngest. You could do whatever you wanted to, right? The (laughs) rules didn't apply to you. We blazed the trail. You didn't have any rules. You did whatever you want to. That's crazy. (sighs) Still jealous about that. There's one more. The middle child, the middle child, middle child, raise your hand, make some noise, middle children. Who's with me today? Yeah, you've been forgotten your entire life. (laughs) And to honor you today, you're going to get a present on your way out. It's a (laughs) hand-me-down. It's too good. It's too good. I have to use that. Oh, man. But think about how our relationships, think about how our perspectives are shaped just from day one, how we grew up in our homes. 
It shapes our perspective. And you guys, we all see things differently. When you bring two people together, there are two different perspectives always represented. I love when I, I meet with people who are about to be married. Love is in the air, the premarital counseling sessions. Like, oh, I love everything about my future spouse. Do you? Do, are you sure about that? Because there are two of you. And they're like, oh, we've never had an argument. I'm going, yeah, if that's true, one of you is not necessary, all right? It just doesn't make any sense. Come on. We have different perspectives. We, we're wired differently. And just because someone sees something differently than you or acts differently in different situations than you do doesn't necessarily make them wrong. And everybody's like, what? 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 Yeah, it doesn't make them wrong. Everybody sees things from different perspectives. And I want you to think about today your relationships. And honestly, I would like you to really lean in and think about a relationship right now that God is placing on your heart. I'm praying that he's going to put a name and a face on everybody's mind today. A relationship that you need to invite Jesus to be the center of. Maybe it's a relationship that's hurting right now. It's a relationship that's been broken. Maybe it's a relationship with someone in your life who you realize is desperate to be invited to a changed life, to connect with Jesus. I want you to really think about who it is that God's placing on your heart today that that you can invite Jesus right into the middle of that relationship and to be thinking and dreaming about how just doing that, inviting Jesus right there into that relationship, how it could change the whole dynamic of that relationship. Because when we love like Jesus loves, when we forgive like he forgives, man, that brings all kinds of healing and that makes our relationships that much stronger. So I just want you to think about that as we dive into this story today. Uh, This story is found in Luke chapter 10 and this is This has become one of my favorite stories uh, in the New Testament. We've talked about this a time or two uh, over the last few years, but I want you to lean in because I'm telling you, God has spoken to me as I've been studying this and brought out a a couple new truths from this story that I think are going to be powerful and pertinent to each of us here today. It says in Luke 2, as they were traveling along, Jesus went into a village. and It says a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary. Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to him talk. But Martha was upset about all the work she had to do. All right, so right out of the gate, you got two sisters and there is tension, all right? Martha, obviously the oldest child, right? She's doing all the work. She's being responsible. She's getting things done. Yes, I am admittedly completely biased toward the older sibling. I'm just going to admit that right now. She's doing all the work. And Mary, her sister, is just sitting there being lazy, sitting at the feet of Jesus, ignoring all of the work that needs to be done, right? And you can kind of see this playing out, right? You can see Martha just kind of, Mary, does anybody else get those nonverbal signals from their spouse when you're not doing what you think should be expected of you? It's just me? Am I the only one that gets that look? <laughs> Admittedly, I'm lazy sometimes, and I don't do what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> She's getting frustrated. This is a big deal. Jesus is in the house. Martha's going, I have to make this an amazing experience for Jesus. I need to be the best hostess I can possibly be. That's her mindset. I want you to think about that for a second. She is focused completely on serving Jesus. And that's good. That, that's not a bad thing. But the way that she's expressing her love toward Jesus, the way that she feels like she's making a difference, is by serving in this moment. And she's getting really irritated that Mary doesn't see things the same way she does. Mary, on the other hand, is 100% focused on just simply listening to Jesus. That's 100% what she's focused on. She says the same thing. Jesus is in the house. The only thing I want to do is listen to what he is speaking into my life right now because this is an unbelievable moment in my life. Both of them have good intentions, good hearts, but they're coming at this from two completely different angles. You see the problem there. That's why it's so important that we we circle these differences that we have and take the time to be willing to invest in our relationships. 
You got to be willing to take a step back and realize the people in my life that I care about, we're not always going to see eye to eye on the same things. There's going to be friction sometimes. There's going to be conflict. And that's not always bad. These were good things. Again, Martha focused on serving Jesus. Man, God calls each of us to use the gifts and abilities that he's given us to expand his kingdom. The purpose and the plan God creates us for involves serving. Yeah, dive in. Use your gifts and abilities. You can volunteer here at Crossroads. Live into the plan that God has for you. I would encourage you to do that. You'll be getting the most out of this community when you are actively serving Jesus with the gifts and abilities that he's given you. Martha's doing a good thing. Mary, completely focused on listening to Jesus. How can you fault her for that? She is in the presence of Jesus. Nothing else matters. I'm going to listen to what Jesus is speaking to my life. I say it again, there's nothing wrong with being different. The problem comes when we begin to resent our differences. When we realize that there is conflict, but then we don't invest in that relationship. When we either sweep it under the rug, we ignore it, or we act like it'll, it'll get better on its own, and we don't actually take the time to confront the conflict. What's crazy is no one likes confrontation. There are very few people who enjoy confrontation. I mean, honestly, most people avoid confrontation and conflict as much as they possibly can. But if you don't confront the issue, if you don't ever have an honest conversation, it'll never be resolved. And when you have someone who sees something from a different angle than you, that you never talk about it, you never get resolution, then that resentment, it creates a divide in your relationship that doesn't need to be there. All you need to be doing is willing to talk about it, humbly come to the person with you in love and say, hey, this is bothering me. Can we talk about this? I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding what's going on here. Those simple conversations resolve all kinds of conflict. But when we harbor our resentment, when we hold on to that, it becomes anger, it becomes bitterness, and it becomes a divide between some of the relationships that God intended for us to be closest with, with our, our family members, with our dearest friends. It, we, it, our relationships take work. I want to challenge you today. Don't be lazy in your relationships. Invest in those relationships that God has given you. Yeah, people are going to see things differently than you. You know what? If you lean in, you might just learn something. You might become a richer and deeper person just because you learned something from your friend. We're not always right. I know that's shocking. I, some of you are really having a hard time hearing that. We're not always right. But here's the thing. Martha goes to the next level. I mean, she's banging the pots and the pans. I know some of you have seen that look. It's not just me. It says, so she asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work all by myself? Tell her to help me. Will you think about what Martha has done here just for a second? This is where I got struck between the eyes this week. And as I'm putting this together, I'm thinking about this, I'm going, oh my word. Martha is so focused on what she is doing, which is a good thing. She's serving Jesus. It's a good thing. But she's so focused on her job doing the things the way that she wants them to be done that she actually has the audacity to interrupt what Jesus is doing. Can you just stop and think about that? She interrupted Jesus. What he is doing, what he is saying. He's, Jesus, we need to talk. Mary is not helping me, and I'm very furious. Tell her to help me. She's so consumed by what she is doing, the task at hand, that she's fallen into a trap. She has fallen in love with the task of serving Jesus more than she loves Jesus in that moment. Duh! (laughs) What? That's a thing? (laughs) She loved the task more than she loved Jesus. And it got her thinking all messed up. She had the audacity to interrupt Jesus, say, Jesus, I understand you're doing something right now, but that's not as important as what I'm doing right now. Man, that's a trap that we have to avoid. We have to make sure that we are inviting Jesus into the center of our relationships. 
Because when we start doing things our way, when I can only see the world the way that I want to see it, I miss out on what Jesus is doing and what he's trying to teach me. The reality is Jesus cares much more about who you are becoming than he cares about what it is that you are doing. I want you to think about that. He cares much more about who you are becoming than he does about what you are doing. The the act of service can't be more important to you than Jesus himself. That's why it's so incredibly important that when it comes to our relationships, we have to be mindful that, yeah, I have to invest in these relationships. They take work. But I have to make sure I'm inviting Jesus into this relationship so that when I have a problem with someone, when I find that I have differences, I'm inviting Jesus right into the middle of that situation so that I can listen to what it is that he needs to say. I think this is really incredibly important. When you're having friction in a relationship, I I would contend the most important thing you can do is draw near to Jesus. Draw near so you can hear. And then listen. Listen to what he is saying to you. We have to stop and listen Otherwise, we'll never learn. We'll get stuck in our own ways. My way is the right way. And you never have any resolution in the conflict. Listen to how Jesus responds. It says, the Lord answered her, Martha, 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 Martha. I did not plan on saying that. That just just came out. (laughs) He says, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. Think about being in Martha's shoes right now. Mary is not helping me. Jesus, tell her to help me. Martha, (laughs) now it's in my head. Martha, Martha, Martha. I can't stop saying it. Martha, (laughs) Martha, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. I mean... That had to have floored her. She's been getting all hot and bothered. She's all worked up. Mary's not up. Jesus, tell her to help me. Martha, you worry and fuss about a lot of things. What? (laughs) That is not what she was expecting to hear. That's why you've got to draw near to Jesus so you can hear what he's saying. You've got to listen because sometimes he has that funny way of redirecting our spirit, redirecting our heart. He helps us love others the way that he loves us. He helps us forgive others the way he forgives us. We're not always right. We're just wired differently than other people. We look at the same situation, we respond different ways. And if we're willing to invite Jesus into those relationships, into those moments, that's how we navigate that, by following his voice. He gives you wisdom. He gives you peace. He brings healing and 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 restores relationships that are broken. That's what Jesus does. He's the God who heals. He brings us life. So when Jesus says, you worry and fuss about a lot of things, he says to her, there's only one thing you need. Mary has made the right choice. And that one thing will not be taken away from her. No, she's not going to go help you. She's going to stay right here. She's chosen the better thing. So at this point, Martha is just completely floored, right? She had the audacity to tell Jesus, hey, have Mary move over here. And she assumed that she was in the right. But you can never trust your assumptions without consulting Jesus. And think about in Scripture what people lost because they assumed that God was with them. There's a story in the Old Testament where Saul, who is king of Israel, makes the assumption that his... his, uh, His army is off to go to battle and they need to have an offering, but they're supposed to wait for the prophet Samuel to come and make this offering. Saul doesn't think there's enough time for Samuel to do that. So Saul assumes that he is the king of Israel can go ahead and present this offering to God. That was an assumption that he made. I can make this offering to God. God will be with me. Saul lost his kingship because of that assumption. Moses leading the Israelites through the wilderness. There was a time when God told him to strike a rock and water would come out of that rock and bring refreshment and life to all of the Israelites that were wandering through the wilderness. Later on in this journey through the wilderness, Moses in anger responded to the people who were whining and complaining because that's what they did. He responded in anger by hitting another rock. He assumed that God was with him, but God wasn't. Because Moses made that assumption, he was not able to lead the Israelites into the promised land. We miss out and, and we, we lose sight of what God wants when we just run on our own assumptions. <laughs> Consider this. Mary and Joseph, in Luke chapter 2, 
they left Jerusalem assuming that Jesus was with them. And he was not. He was back in the temple learning and teaching them and blowing people's minds by what he was able to do at 12 years old. They actually left Jesus behind, his parents. They assumed that he was there, but he was not. We have to be very careful to not fall under the assumption that just because we think something a certain way that God is with us, just because I don't see eye to eye with someone who's important to me in my life, because there's an argument, I am not automatically just necessarily right. I need to invite Jesus into the middle of that conversation, in the middle of that relationship, draw near so I can hear, and then listen to what he is saying. That's how we become more like him. That's how we love the way he loves. That's how we forgive the way he forgives. He gives us wisdom. He guides our steps. He brings peace to our hearts, and he heals broken relationships. Just make sure when you're going into battle that Jesus is with you. Don't assume that you're right, that he's with you. Because Martha assumed that, and that was quite an embarrassing moment for her. I will say the final piece to this is it's really important in our relationships that we imitate Jesus in all that we do. That has to be the guiding light for us. It's imitating Jesus, truly loving the way he loves forgiving the way that he forgives. I I love what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 5, and I I just want to read this to you. Would you just consider the magnitude of what Paul is writing here? He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. He wants you to become more like him. How do you do that? Well, you imitate him, and you invest in your relationship with Jesus. That's the most important relationship you have. You invite him to be at the center of every relationship that you have, and then you imitate him. Why? Because you're his child. He wants you to look like him. How do we do that? Well, we live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What Paul is defining here is the agape love of Jesus. It's not that love that is passionate or or just based on feeling or emotion. No, that is selfless, sacrificial, committed love. That's what imitating Jesus looks like. I love the way he loves. I forgive the way he forgives. That kind of love is patient. It is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It keeps no record of wrongs. It rejoices in all the good. I want to ask you today, what relationship do you need to invite Jesus into? Is there a relationship that's broken, that needs healing? Maybe you need to love like Jesus loves. Maybe you just need to let it go. You need to forgive the way that Jesus forgives. Maybe you're realizing today that you've got influence on someone who is desperate for the hope of Jesus. And you need to invite Jesus right into the middle of that relationship so that he can give you wisdom, so he can present an opportunity for you to connect someone with him. Our relationships matter. God places people in our lives for a reason. And I want to encourage you today, invest in your relationships I think at the end of life, we don't like to think about this very often, but at the end of life, when we all take our last breath right before we stand in the presence of God, I mean, the reality is, is our family will be there with us, maybe a few friends. Make sure you're investing in those relationships that matter the most and that you're not allowing resentment or bitterness or anger to cause a divide that just isn't necessary. Love the way God loves forgive the way he forgives and invite Jesus into the center of your relationships. Would you close in prayer with me? Jesus, today I'm just so thankful that you are here with us. And right now, we just, we create space right now in this moment to draw near so that we can hear. And Jesus, in this moment, we just commit to listening to your voice. the names, the faces that you're placing on our hearts, relationships that you're calling us to invest in, relationships that you are calling us to invite you into the center of, 
the relationships that you're calling us to imitate you in, to lead by setting a good example and being like you. God, we just surrender these relationships to you. And we ask that you would help us to love like you love us and to forgive like you have forgiven us and to live our lives in such a way that our light shines as a beacon in the darkness, pointing people to the hope that we have in you. God, would you bless us? Relationships are difficult. They all have their ups and downs. But Jesus, when we invite you to be the center of these relationships, that's where you begin to work your miracles. That's when you begin to change things that only you can change. And Jesus, I pray right now for a miracle. For the person that needs that miracle and that relationship right now that's lifting that up to you, God, I just pray that you would be with them where they are at right now in this moment. Give them your peace that passes all understanding and give us the power to love the way that you love us. Jesus, for all that you've done, we thank you. We give you praise today because you're worthy. We pray this in your holy name today. Amen.